A Valdosta family whose daughter was assaulted at a rest stop are warning others to look for the warning signs. Camila Williams is in studio to share some safety tips when making a stop at a rest stop. That's right. Haley and Brett Hester just wanted to go to have a fun Friday and see a Reds game or a Braves game. Sorry, wrong city, but a simple bathroom <laughs> break it turned into something more. It was a sunny Friday afternoon for the Hester family, but things took a turn at rest area 19 on Interstate 475. On our way into the restroom, there was one juvenile um, female on a laptop um, at the counter in the restroom. My daughter um, and I go into two stalls right next to one another. Eight-year-old Addie came out the stall first. Her mom says that's when two girls, 12 years old, pulled on Addie's hair and covered her mouth. I think she froze in that moment, um, just being terrified. So she did not scream out or call for me. Not realizing what just happened, Haley and Addie tried to leave, but the two girls did it again. And this time she did yell out for me. So I was able to pull her out of the bathroom. I mean, for what? What? I mean, for what? You know what? Give me a clear yeah. touch, my daughter. Because the girls are juveniles, we can't show you the video Brett took, but she says the two girls didn't care. But y'all can record me. The state-run rest area on 475 doesn't have cameras or security. Major Brad Wolf with the sheriff's office says it's a warning to always be alert. A lot of the tips are the same as we would give during the holiday shopping season. Be alert, be aware of your surroundings. If something doesn't look right, it's probably not. If somebody looks suspicious, you know, you may not want to go up to the area they're at or whatever. And you can stay in groups if you can. Wolf says the Bibb Sheriff's Office patrols the rest area, but not regularly. And we're back. And today we've got our good friend, Don Mann. Good to see you, Don. Yeah, it's good seeing you, Chris. Likewise, Mike Sterling in motion. Where are you headed to, Mike? Uh, today, headed for Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Right on. Bombs to dispose of in Myrtle Beach. Yes, sir. <laughs> right on. And Jeff MD, uh, our very own in-house 007 agent. So since Mike is driving today, I'll handle the uh, conflicted question. It's a very short one from the survivalist series. And we'll circle back on this at the end of this episode <clears throat> to give our answers. Is having a dog a good idea after the collapse of modern society? Why and what breed? Fairly simple, straightforward question for a change. All right. So today's topic we're discussing transitional spaces, uh, rest areas and truck stops in particular. Both of them have become a hotbed for assaults and other types of crime, robberies. All of the links that I'm fixing to show will be on our website. So there'll be a link down below, click it, go through to our website, and we'll have links to all of these if you want to review them in more depth. Suffice it to say that the page I have up right now with uh, crime statistics related to rest areas have skyrocketed in the past 20 years. And we've all got interesting stories of things that have happened at rest areas. The second one here, while this is not current, this is from the 90s, I put it up here anyway because there was a serial killer who was known as the rest area killer, and he murdered over 70 people across 21 states. So prime hunting ground for predators like that individual everybody out there who touches the travel business you know whether it be maps like map quest or triple a have tips for your safety at, at rest areas and truck stops so again i'm not going to go through all of these articles and waste people's time but i will link it all as i previously mentioned this one here is kind of an interesting story. It made the news here in Florida. Uh, this was a family that was on their way to an Atlanta Braves game, and the, their eight-year-old was almost abducted in a rest area, uh, went to the restroom by themselves, and fortunately, <clears throat> uh, the child wasn't abducted. But especially at truck stops is a prime area for people to be abducted and then sold into human trafficking. Here's a, another story uh, more specific than the previous one with regards to the rise in crime and focusing specifically on murders. So rest areas are a top area where murders happen. And this story goes into detail on that. Here's another one from another company that has 
a bunch of tips for rest area safety. And some of the things in here I don't necessarily agree with. So the first one here, never sleep at night in your car. Well, I've stopped multiple times as I was, you know, driving across the country in my truck and got to the point where I had to get a couple hours shut. I wasn't safe to drive any further. I leave my truck on, uh, windows rolled up and a gun's lying on my chest. So if somebody were to peek inside, they would see that I'm, I'm clearly armed. So there's some instances I think where you can sleep at rest areas and be relatively safe, all things considered. This one here now moves into the things to do at a truck stop. And this particular article is advising people not to sleep in your car at a truck stop. I've never slept in my truck at a, at a truck stop before. Kind of agree with the premise of this article more so than the one on rest areas. But here's another example of groups of criminals specifically targeting truck stops because there's obviously there's a wealth of things there. Uh, I think one of the upcoming stories I have here is a somebody who stole over a million dollars in sports cars and it was stolen from a truck stop. But this crime group here specifically targeted truckers and patrons at truck stops and robbed them of uh, their valuables. As I mentioned earlier, so truck stops are a key area uh, for people being abducted and sold into human trafficking. I can actually tell a story about this, which I'll pick up a little bit later in the episode, but that's a real thing. Here's the one where an inmate escaped and stole over a million dollars of sports cars uh, from a semi that was at a truck stop. And this is just a ge general random article on an assault that happened at a truck stop. And it, it's a fairly frequent occurrence at truck stops for multiple different reasons. Mike, without going off into X-rated territory, uh, recap the, the story you told us of uh, the altercation at a truck stop. So uh, I was on my way home. This was in 2002. I was on my way home from a job in Wyoming. And uh, I was pretty exhausted. I'd driven all the way across Missouri, hadn't been able to find any, any hotels. I'd driven, I went all the way through St. Louis. Turns out there was, you know, like some kind of Olympic, Olympic event happening in the St. Louis area. So all the hotels for hundreds of miles around the city were all sold out. It was a mess. Um, so anyway, here I am. I'm in southern Illinois, headed home, and I'm exhausted. It's like, uh, I want to say it's like one or two o'clock in the morning. I was like, yeah, that's it. I've got to pull over. I've got to get some sleep. So pulled into a spot <laughs> over by the, over in a, in a quiet area and, uh, you know, pulled out my whoopee and, and uh, threw it over me and, and packed my Walther up underneath it, laid my seat back and, and went to sleep. Woke up a little while later, hearing a whole bunch of screaming. Crack my eye open, and here is a shirtless trucker uh, in the middle of a knife fight with an extremely large transvestite wearing, you know, like the six-inch hooker pumps. And because apparently said trucker wound up uh, getting more than he had paid for, <laughs> apparently. And it was just like, hmm. Well, there's something you don't see every day. Oh, look at the time. I think I got to go. So I got about an hour and a half worth of, worth of sleep and said, yeah, I think I'm going to I think I'm going to leave because somebody's going to get stabbed out here tonight. <laughs> I don't have a story that, that's as good as that, but I will cover some of the basics here. So the one thing that all of the websites that I found as far as their tips and tricks are concerned, basically focus on something that we discuss all the time, which is situational awareness. So, Don, we're back to being in condition yellow or condition orange when you're in one of these transitionary spaces and not be buried in your weapon of mass distraction, paying attention to what's going on around you. Uh, give us your advice, Don, as far as you don't live life as a scared person. You're a confident man. You've got great training. But where, where does your condition, you know, whether it be white, yellow, orange, et cetera, how does that move as you go enter different spaces, rest areas, truck stops, gas stations, those sort of things? <clears throat> well, Chris, you know, just on the data on the uh, rest rest areas and the truck stops, 
it's gotten so much worse since the last 25 years or so. I mean, the crime, the carjackings, the drug deals, the sex trafficking, the larceny, petty larceny, all of that is skyrocketing. So for some reason, these criminals, and what is it now, over 100,000 of them are repeat offenders out on the streets now. They're picking these truck stops and rest areas because the prey is easy. The prey are tired, sleepy people. Some are sleeping, some need a nap. They're walking to the restroom, maybe leaving the car unlocked, and they're not aware of their surroundings. So as a criminal, I, I can see why they're picking these uh, areas now to commit these crimes. <clears throat> there are a lot of tips out there now. When I go into a rest area, I try to park right next to the doorway and in and out. And when you see a rest area, there are a lot of locations. If you want to get some sleep, you try to park next to a, a shady area and you're away from every everybody. And that's where the criminals can hide. So I've, I've actually slept between trucks to try to get their shade. But now with this data that's coming out, people are hiding behind trucks. And it's easy to, to attack somebody in a car that's behind the trucks. What a lot of people are doing now is staying away from the rest areas if you need the sleep. And I'm doing the same thing. Instead of sleeping at a rest area, I'll go to a public place, a gas station or a convenience store, because it's well lit. There's, there's people around, there's security around, there's cameras usually. And um, so rest areas are a concern because that's where the criminals are going. If you are at a rest area, it's best especially women. Women are being attacked there more than men. Try not to be the loner. Try to walk with somebody if you're leaving your car. And use your car fob because it makes a noise. And if there's a criminal nearby, they'll know, well, I can't break into that car. If I do, it's going to make a loud noise when I break the window. Uh, try not to show expensive jewelry or have a laptop on your dash or something expensive that can lure a criminal into your vehicle. Mm -hmm. But um, these rest areas do get a lot more dangerous at nighttime. And um, we have to consider it another area in our country that's not as safe as we once thought they were. So my my uh, Cooper's colors go from never, they're never in the white when I'm out in public. They'll definitely go from yellow to orange. Uh, I'm pulling the rest area, it's an orange, and I look for where the criminal can be. And I know when I leave my vehicle to the rest area, back to my vehicle, it's a danger area. And I get back in the vehicle where it's safe. When I leave the vehicle, of course, I lock it up. And um, I'm armed, usually. And um, I just I think people should be aware that this is where the, the thugs and the criminals are heading now. Yeah, whether we're discussing human beings or animals, predators always want to have the element of surprise. So predators hunt water holes. Exactly. The reason we always discuss, you know, not being wrapped up in your phone as a weapon of mass distraction is that gives the bad guys the element of surprise because you're not paying attention. Your situational awareness is virtually non-existent. And in many cases, and everybody here has probably had instances of this where you've run across somebody who looks a little bit shady and as long as you maintain your confidence and you maintain eye contact, you just took away their element of surprise. They're, you're therefore not the easiest target for them. And you can accomplish a lot by just maintaining eye contact without taking it to the level of being, you know, uh, provocative. This episode of SDN is brought to you by Switch It Up, your national grid down service provider. Get a quote on a solar PV system with battery backup at switchitupinc.com or click the link in the video description below. Don, you mentioned uh, gas stations and choosing well-lit areas and parking close to security cameras. That's an issue at rest areas and truck stops. If there are cameras in either location, they will be close to where the restrooms are or the convenience store and pumps. But at the back of a truck stop there's no cameras back there likely there certainly aren't any in the outlying areas around rest areas so that good advice on your part we do the same thing even when we're traveling you know, my wife and i together so i'm not even traveling solo is we'll park next to a, a street light that's in the parking lot at a rest area 
I will escort her to the restroom and back to the truck. And we don't go near those outlying areas. We, <laughs> we stay away from them. One of the interesting uh, comments that somebody made in one of the articles I was reading was, be friendly to truck drivers. And if, if you're friendly to truck drivers and something bad does happen, they're likely to come to your defense, mm -hmm. which in a lot of parts of America, that's just not the case. Instead of coming to your, assist you, people will light up their phone to take a video of it, but they won't help you in any way whatsoever. I mean, there's a horrible story from this past weekend, a gentleman from New York, uh, he's known as, as the Trump bus guy. So he, he decked out this bus years ago, covered up in Trump merchandise and travels across the country promoting Donald Trump and those sort of things. And not only was he robbed on the weekend, but the perpetrators bashed his skull in with a sledgehammer. And, right. you know, I, I'm not saying that that was at a truck stop or a rest area, but at the end of the day, there's, there's some pretty undesirable people out there doing some pretty heinous things. So situational awareness don't park somewhere in the dark try to get close to security cameras because the bad guys know that they want to travel where they're least likely to be seen i think one another important piece of advice not everybody does this but carry some type of uh, a self-defense tool yeah great example i actually have one over here as well that we're using for testing jeff what's interesting that you held that up you're on mute, Jeff. No, we. Uh, Jeff is why we can't have nice things. This is true. Uh, no, I purchased these. We have them attached to our uh, our keychains, and it's CS and pepper spray. And you just flip the you, know, you flip the little thing over and push the button. It's small enough. It's it's very unintrusive, but you hit someone in the face with this, you're going to get their attention. So something like this, you're walking and no one's even going to know what you have in your hand. But if someone accosts you, you're prepared. Yeah, that's that's ironic and it's good advice. Jeff, were you the one who said a while ago that if if all you're carrying is a is a gun and you equated to being a hammer, that everything you encounter is therefore a nail? Was that you that said that? That wasn't me. I, I'll take credit for it because it's a really okay. good line. Um, but I know like Jen even said, you know, you don't, you want to have a le uh, a less lethal option. Yep. And, you know, again, pepper spray is your first one. And then if they keep coming, then you draw your concealed carry and do what you got to do. Um, but I think if someone is just trying to mug you, you hit them in the face with this, they're going to change their mind. Yeah, I agree. So, I, I mean, I'm holding one here that we're evaluating from Sabre. It's, it's exactly the same idea as yours where there's a flick switch. Yep. It's, it's got a clip for your belt. It's small. It's not obtrusive. We, we've got some larger stuff from them as well. We have no relationship with Sabre whatsoever. But uh, here's one of their uh, pepper gels. So you got to be a little bit more accurate, but it's stickier stuff. See, I wish mine had a red flip switch mine's black so yours is easier to see you know i went through a bunch of reviews and everything kept coming back to saber as being a really good choice not that they're they the are choice but yeah and, and that's Mike what i asked, carried that's what i carried in new york city last week right yeah and i think you were the one who originally turned me on to them before i started researching them so jeff yeah, it's interesting you'd mention that because jen said that because in washington <clears throat> Um, if you have to use a gun in self-defense, you're probably still getting charged with some type of homicide. Maybe it's manslaughter or not murder, but you're probably still going to be charged with something. Here in Florida, we're the first state that had stand, stand your ground. We got it in 2006. So you have no duty to retreat in the state of Florida. And the sentence is three sentences, or pardon me, the law is three sentences long. It's really straightforward. If you feel like I'm endangering your life, you, therefore, under that law, have the right to use deadly force. Here's a problem that Cindy and I were discussing last night, is what happens if you perceive somebody to be a threat and, and you pull your sidearm, and as you pull the trigger, they're turning sideways, and you hit them in the side or the back, and there's no cameras. Now it's your word against the bad guys, that, and he can very clearly say that he was trying to escape. He was trying to get away from you. And you ended up shooting them. You could still end up in some hot water here in Florida 
under those types of circumstances. So that's one of the reasons we started looking at the stuff, Jeff. It's interesting that you would have something very, very similar there. Um, that, and I think I mentioned before, shameless plug for our friends at Waft, uh, we get sent a ton of flashlights. And we went to Waft. Mike and I have been to Waft together. And then uh, Cindy and I went the weekend after that. And Don's been there as well. And we get sent a gazillion flashlights. So this flashlight is considered by the manufacturer to be an EDC pocket flashlight. It's huge. Like, <laughs> I, I'm not carrying this in my pocket sort of thing, right? Uh, and Philip does a lot of training at Waft. And I didn't intend on this to be a plug for him, but... This is his flashlight. See, Mike's is around the same size. Jason Sawyer can testify That's to this. That, pretty small. Yeah. And, you know, one click on and off, you know, easy to operate. Jason Sawyer will not carry a flashlight if you have to rub your belly, jump up and down, <laughs> say Hail Mary three times and press the button three times fast to get it to turn on. And I don't blame him. So, like, from an EDC perspective and extra weapons, Philip goes through this whole thing where he's interrupting people's OODA loops, you know, by hitting them in the face with a flashlight or even hitting the ground during daytime, not just necessarily at nighttime. So while we're on this topic, again, I didn't anticipate that we'd go down this particular tangent, but Tony Blauer frequently teaches people not to carry these types of devices in your prominent hand, because if you get sucker punched, or anything like that, your body will immediately clamp down on whatever you have in your hands. So for example, if we're leaving the grocery store, I always carry things in my left hand for that specific reason. I'm right-handed. My right hand's free to grab a weapon, a pistol, whatever the case may be. And the same applies for these flashlights. So when you go through all the flashlight drills, if you do them with your off hand, you still have your right hand free to you know grab your sidearm or whatever the case may be. But we're going to be doing an upcoming video on flashlights and how effective they can be used as a self-defense tool i kid you not just by turning my head from there to there i'm looking at a dozen different flashlights that we've been sent and the the spread in effectiveness is pretty big i don't know if i showed you guys this or not but that you can carry this in a side holster this flashlight it has several different modes but uh, the one mode is you know it's essentially a, an old old school taser as well as a flashlight and it's big enough that you could thump somebody with it as well go ahead joe what brand is that uh so this was recommended by philip at waft of all places uh guard dog guard dog so interesting thing jeff they make a they make a fixed blade knife that is electrified just like this flashlight so it's dual purpose it's a knife and a flashlight i i want to say this was i think we paid 29 dollars for it so it's not super expensive but Anyway, like I say, I digress, but here's a funny thing. I'm looking at the links that I brought up earlier, and one of the recommendations is to have a taser or a stun gun, which is kind of ironic that I just picked that up. Uh, and again, all those links will be on the website. Tell me what you guys carry for EDC for these types of scenarios, just out of curiosity, because now I'm carrying the small pepper spray. I always carry the flashlight, and I've got a sidearm, and I've got a, a pocket in me. Don, why don't you go? Yeah, well, Chris, you know, I, I love the idea of a flashlight, especially the kind you can use as a weapon as well, because especially in the dark, as we all know, you if you make a mistake, there's no no harm. If somebody's coming up to you and you take that flashlight and shine it in their eyes, they can't see you and you can see them. And most importantly, you can see their hands. It works well. Uh, you don't want to be war within arm's reach. If you get within arm's reach of somebody, they and especially if you're a younger uh, person or a woman or a smaller person, the threat can get a hold of you. So you try to stay within arm's reach further than within arm's reach. But if you are within arm's reach and you have that flashlight right between the eyes, it's going to make the person's eyes water if if that's what you choose to do and you're not armed. Um, you mentioned, you know, what would happen if someone did turn um, and now it's that person's word against yours, like I wasn't going to do anything. I turn, I wasn't a threat. What we would always teach the government personnel is you had to just prove intent. The person had intent and you had to prove that person's intention was to cause me bodily harm. Now, you, if the person was holding a weapon pointing at you, you could prove that. 
if there was a little old lady across two lanes of highway holding a weapon, you can't say she had the intent to cause harm. So you have to have, you have to prove intent and you have to prove that the person had the opportunity to hurt you. So if the person was up close to you with an arm's reach or a few feet away and they had a baseball bat, that person has the opportunity to cause harm. But if that person was in a shopping mall and you saw them four lanes down and they had a baseball bat, they don't have the opportunity or the intent. Mm -hmm. And then the third thing you really have to prove is my life was in danger. I was, I was, my life was threatened. So I can prove my life was threatened for telling the stories. That person had the opportunity and that person had the intent. And um, keeping those three things in mind, if you use a flashlight, boom, they're blinded. If you use it as a weapon, boom, at least you could say it wasn't a, a lethal action you're making. But if you do go lethal and you draw from your concealed and you can prove intent, opportunity, and your life was endangered, the way the laws, I know they're going away and they're getting weaker and weaker and weaker, but those are the three things you'd really have to prove in court. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Uh, the intent is kind of the basic element of common law, right? All of us who have common law that came from the British, uh, it, one of the elements of a crime is intention, the most important element of a crime. Jeff, what do you do for EDC other than that small pepper spray? Well, you, I pepper spray. Sometimes I'll have, uh, you know, I'll carry a, a knife on a sheath. Um, and then, of course, the, the fallback is always going to be a concealed carry. And to be honest, a lot of times I don't carry concealed when I'm, I'm not on my person when I'm driving. It's, you know, it's not comfortable when you're driving in a car and not really necessary sure. but i always have a gun in the car and it's always available so if you you know going to a truck stop and it looks shady and eh, you put the gun back on yeah good advice mike you just did this trip to new york city we've we've had a couple chuckles about it but you went to, right you went to great lengths to put together edc kits for yourself and your wife seeing as you couldn't carry a firearm there amongst other right. things what, right. what did what did you put together for that trip? So one of the things that um, that you know it's your EDC has to you know I hate to say it we're we're supposed to be law abiding citizens so your EDC has to comply with certain laws so you know normally you know normally I've got a I've got a bench made uh, pocket knife and in New York City it, part of the law is you can carry a knife up to less than four inch blade but uh like mine's usually on a regular pocket clip but if a law enforcement officer sees that in new york city that's considered brandishing so you actually have to have it buried down inside of a pocket and there's there's all kinds of places that you're going through security checkpoints and stuff and they're giving you all kinds of grief about a knife and yeah it's 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 just a pain in the butt now um of course, because I was in a denied environment, I could not carry a firearm. So, of course, we were carrying we were carrying pepper spray. Um, and up there, you can only carry OC. Uh, so the pepper spray that you have from Sabre is OC and CN. Yeah. And uh, you can't you, you're not allowed to have that. And you have to have it uh, of, of only that small size that you've got. Uh, we also carried we also carried uh, stun guns which you can only have a certain size of stun gun and you cannot carry a taser with that can actually fire barbs right. out. Um, now, as far as a light goes, normally I carry this little mod light dual fuel, which is a great little light. Um, it's wonderful. It, it's small enough. It fits in my pocket and the batteries recharge. Great. Um, and after, after a lot of work with Keith from Christian warrior, um, I changed a few things on on my uh, on my church security group uh, carry, um, and I carried I carried this flashlight in New York. I've got a Claris uh, with a K. I don't know if you guys are familiar with them. Great law enforcement grade flashlights. They are not cheap. I'll tell you that right now. But the big thing about this light is. I can either go, I can either go regular beam or it has a other button on it. It has an alternate button on this, on the back 
where I can press that and it strokes mm. very, very rapidly. And it is really, really bright and, and a very hard strobe. The other, the other point is it's, it's almost 50% longer than this uh, light that I've got here, this model light. Uh, but the big thing is it also has a crenellated bezel. Mm. So the whole, the whole bezel up here is basically big, angry, sharp teeth up there particularly for so if i pull it out i can whack somebody with that right in the right across the eyebrows um and yeah that will definitely if you've never been smacked right between the eyes or across the eyebrows or something like that man i'm i'm here to tell you that is definitely going to change your mind about what it is that you're doing with your day um but <laughs> having alternate alternatives now is a big thing especially if you're on a if you're on a church security team or any kind of a security team having an option available to you a less lethal option i am seeing is a is a huge thing now to be able to to be able to you know survive in a legal litigious society that we're in so on the edc thing just a, another small point you know, I've crisscrossed the country multiple times. I've I've done it with other people. I've done it, you know, solo by myself. And ironically enough, I live in the gun shine state and we're one of only four states in the country that you can't open carry. So California, Illinois, New York, and Florida. But as soon as we get out of the state of Florida and we end up at rest areas, or maybe we stop at a truck stop to get fuel and a bite to eat, most of the time I open carry. And when you're by yourself, especially when you're by yourself, uh, higher level of situational awareness, open caring and reasonably good shape are important things to keep the bad guys away. Cause they're going to pick on somebody easier. So I'm not a big proponent of open carrying in multiple, you know, instances, for example, I would never recommend going into a mall open carrying because if something's going to kick off in the mall, then you're an immediate target. Everybody knows that guy right there has a gun sort of thing. But the exceptions I make to that is when we are interstating and it's saved us a number of times. Remember, Mike, when we left the Sawyers, we got redirected going through Atlanta. We had roads closed, several wrecks, and we ended up stopping on the south side of Atlanta, which is as rough as it gets. And there were probably 25 people in this parking lot where we stopped to get fuel. And there was a hand wash at the back, hand car wash, which was not a hand car wash. We watched people come out of the woods buy their dime bag and disappear back into the woods sort of thing. And when I got out of the truck, you could have heard a pin drop. Everybody was staring at me because I was open carrying plus a couple extra mags. I mean, if I have a staccato, I've got 60 rounds in mags and one in the chamber sort of thing. And if it wasn't for that, we were in the wrong town at the wrong time with the wrong color and uh, what could have, could have been really, really bad. So and the reason I mention that is because one of the common pieces of advice that people give when it comes to rest areas and truck stops and gas stations is not to be a loner, which is precisely my wife can look after herself, but that, does, that I still escort her to and from the restroom. I'll tell you something else where we've seen a number of altercations happen at gas stations when there's been a couple together and they've gone after a person on one side of the vehicle or the other when they're, you know, there's, they're by themselves, essentially, at that point in time. I escort my wife to the truck, open the door for her, close the door before I go and get in my door every single time. And it's not just being, you know, the polite and, and chivalry as it should be. It's also in those sort of situations. We, If anybody's going to be at risk, it should be me, not her. So if anybody has to walk around outside by themselves, it should be me, not her sort of thing. So on that topic, I will mention another thing is that if you dive into the settings for your vehicle, chances are pretty good that you can alter how the doors are locked and unlocked. So for example, our SUV, the way we have it configured, when you hit the unlock button, it only unlocks the driver's door, doesn't unlock any of the other doors. And when you hit the, the lock button once, it locks everything for the entire truck. So I, I've seen at WAFT and other places where people are doing scenario training, they get in the car, beep, beep. They think they're locked in and the bad guy comes up and opens another door, like the passenger door, 
and lets themselves in. So just having a, an SOP, having your own, you know, standard operating procedure of when you're stopping at these places, how your locks operate, knowing how your locks operate. We actually heard a story from a girl who said that she would just hit the buttons on her, you know, remote and indiscriminately until she got in or out of a vehicle sort of thing and had no idea how it properly functioned. Got in a car, person at a gas station, opened her door, pulled her out of the car and started to assault her before a good Samaritan stepped in and saved her. So it sounds like a goofy little thing, but being aware of how your car doors and locks work is, is pretty important for this sort of stuff. Uh, for I think it was Mike, did you mention having laptops or Don mentioned having laptops? Uh, good piece of advice that I've seen multiple people, multiple people give on this topic is to hide all of your valuables in your car so that when you get out the pump gas or go get food or do whatever it is, people can't look in the car and say, oh, that's a nice truck gun that they have sitting in the back seat, you know, or that's a nice laptop bag that they have, those sort of things. So being aware that people are going to be watching you at all times. Um, I like this one from from the one website that says, uh, use your common sense. And uh, what's the old adage? Uh, common sense isn't so common. Common sense is not, is not necessarily common. Uh, yeah isn't that the truth <laughs> um, so, yeah definitely definitely don't be a target unless of course it's bait and you happen to be hunting yourself but you know i digress no no yeah, I, mean, I mean how many people though you know they're in their phone the minute they get out of their car oh yeah you know and it's like you know don't don't do that have your phone with you because that's something that someone will want to steal if you leave it in the car in plain sight, they may, you know, go to steal it. Now I've got an old Jeep that all the has no electronic door anything's. I mean, we're talking roll down windows and you got to push the button to lock the door. Yeah. But when my wife and I go shopping, we have this routine. We go around the car and make sure all the doors are locked. When you you know you walk around the back tailgate, everything. Um, but as also, locked as a Jeep I, can be. Yeah. But I don't, um, you know, we don't keep anything in there that they're going to look at and go, hey, I want to steal that, or at least not visible. They may be under the seat or something, but it's not going to be in plain sight. Yeah, that's good advice. So just quickly, Don, on the comment Jeff made with regards to people and their phones, we were at the grocery store on the weekend, and I watched a girl who I guess was in her mid-20s with her face so preoccupied in her phone, she walked into a freezer. Like, I mean... <laughs> not into a freezer, like walk-in freezer, like walked into the glass freezer doors because she was so preoccupied. Don, go ahead. Yeah, that's sometimes when I see people walk and they're walking toward me with a cell phone in the hand, I kind of like cough and make a noise and just to watch them get startled. But you know, another thing, what I like to keep in my, under my vehicle is you have to have a tire iron. I have a tire iron that's inside my truck or cab. And, and I look at that as my weapon also. So if I'm someplace and I can't have my firearm with me or in the truck, I have a tire iron there as well. And uh, not to regress too much, but we're talking about all the sprays and things people have. There, there have been a few women that I've known who are scared to death. They live alone. And I I'll tell them to make sure they have something like that on their keychain. But also have a place in your house where you can have some wasp spray and then just know where you would use that. You have a door divider here that nobody can see me if I'm on the left side of this divider and you know, you're going to aim six feet. That door opens. It's not supposed to be there. Spray the wasp spray. It has the same effect basically. Oh if you man. Mistake, so much worse. Mistake. Yeah. It and, is um, so much worse to get hit with. Wow. Yeah. It's and you're going to have it with you maybe anyways, right? In your house. So I think a couple of years ago, Don mentioned bear spray in a similar context. And the Karens came out of the woodwork saying that that was against the law and oh. that, that you could be charged for it. And Mike, you and I did a episode last year with Keith Graves from Christian Warrior Training. And the topic came up again. I don't remember if it was bear spray or wasp spray. doesn't matter. And the Karens came out of the woodwork again saying, that's against the law. You can't do that. We did a follow up with Keith. And, and I love Keith because, you know, being a cop for 30 years, countless times somebody said to him, that person <clears throat> needs to be arrested. Okay. For what? You know, what's the yep. statute? What should I charge them under? 
And so Keith addressed it in that follow-up one, Don, you'll be glad to hear this. Somebody was trying to claim that it was a federal law that you couldn't spray somebody with bug spray. And, Good, show uh, me the statute. Yeah. Anyway, long story short, there there is no statute. And, uh, you know, if if you're in your home, like you were advising a woman on how to protect yourself in her home, castle doctrine, number one. And yes, it varies from state to state, but it's still the, the basic premise is similar. But now that all of that's been said, Don, I got 10 bucks, says within 24 hours of this video being published, <laughs> another one of the do-gooders is going to come out and say in the comment section that you are telling people to do something that's not legal and we'll have to defer back to Keith Graves and say, okay, well, what's the statute? What, what's illegal? Yeah, yeah I, I, I feel bad I, for people like that because if there is, say, a 40 or 20 or a 60 year old person who lives by themselves and they, the door is being kicked in, somebody's trying to break in, they don't know how to shoot a weapon, they don't have a weapon, they can't fight them off with the hand. Isn't it better to pick up a can of something like that and spray the person in the face? And if they broke a law, what's worse? So I know there's no law that prevents that from happening, but you've got to protect yourself. You've got to protect yourself. Um, one other thing is if I go into a place and you can't have a knife, you can't have your weapon with you, that's fine. But you can always be wearing a good leather belt with a buckle on it because that quickly comes out as a weapon and you can whip that and stay within arm's distance away from somebody and you whip somebody in the face with a belt buckle, that's also going to get their attention. <laughs> and uh, so you always have a weapon with you if you're wearing a good size belt too. That's, that's good advice. Jeff. Yeah. The, you know, I've said it before but on the whole thing, you spray someone with bug spray, you're going to get in trouble. Well, in that kind of situation, if you're in your house and someone's breaking in, I'm going to opt on the side that's going to keep me alive and not necessarily them, um, or at least that keep them from being healthy. But it's the old better to be tried by 12 than carried by six, because with the 12, you've got a good shot with the six too late. Yeah, very true. Don, when you were mentioning, you know, say a person is uh, a woman who's older and, you know, she has to use whatever means possible to defend herself. I, I give you a, a prime anecdotal example of that just this past weekend in New York City, an elderly woman was coming out of a building. She was pushed down a flight of stairs, assaulted. Her pocketbook was stolen and her keys to her car and her car were all stolen. And she ended up injured pretty bad. And she, the bad guy had the element of surprise again there, but that's a great example of someone like that. Even if you take away the element of surprise, how she's supposed to protect herself. So yeah. by all means necessary is my opinion, right? I agree. A um, couple other quick things. Let's just go back to uh, the rest area stuff. Uh, truck stops as well. When people pull into these areas, gas stations, any of these transitionary spaces, and they have their music blaring, that they've taken away one of their best senses as far as being situationally aware is concerned. I mean, and I'll bet money that it's happened to all four of you. How many times have you guys been trying to find a destination and you turn down the music so you can see better? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You know, well, it's, it's, it's a letter. It's a, it's a level of distraction where you can't focus. A hundred percent. And so, I mean, what I'm getting at is when we talk about best practices for this stuff, if you're pulling into a rest area, you're pulling into a truck stop, you're pulling into a gas station, either turn your music off or turn it down so that you're not giving up at least the auditory situational awareness there. Here's another thing before you pull into somewhere, and I don't know if everybody's aware of this or not, but you can go into any map software now on your phone and punch in crime near me, murders near me, assaults near me, whatever you want. So we used to live in a, a gated community on the outskir outskirts of Dertona, which is Daytona. We call it Dertona. Dertona is, is the most dangerous city in the country with a population under 100,000 when it comes to violent crime and murders. So that subdivision was built, started to be built in the 80s. And there were 1,700 homes in that gated community. And if you punched in murders near me, there was one bubble popped up out of 1,700 homes, which had been a home invasion in the 80s, nothing since then. But the entire surrounding area 
there were so many bubbles on top of each other, you couldn't even read the map at all. So as you're choosing your destinations or you're, you know, you have a co-pilot, have them punch in something like crime near me, salt near me, murders near me. And when it pops up a bunch of bubbles around a gas station, a truck stop or a rest area, that's probably not the place that you want to stop, you know, and it takes two sides. The information's there. You just have to leverage it and utilize it. I've got one more note. And then if you guys have anything else, we'll cover that before we do the uh, conflicted question. So I told you guys a, a story. I'm going to do the shortened version. Uh, my former brother-in-law uh, spent most of his life in jail for two pretty heinous rapes. And when he got out the second time, he immediately went to North Carolina where felons can own muskets. Nowhere else in the country is that allowed for felons. And then started a letter writing campaign to my ex-wife. He sent 1,200 handwritten letters saying that he would, the, the Bible said he could marry his sister. The Bible said he could prostitute out his sister. And that he was coming to Florida to abduct her, was going to take her back to North Carolina, was going to pimp her out at truck stops, and they would live happily ever after. And uh, his videos, which include a lot of this stuff, ironically enough, are still on YouTube. It's absolutely crazy stuff. But the only reason I mention this story is because here's somebody like from the bottom of society. The guy is, is a rapist. He raped, you know, an old lady. He raped a young girl. And even he recognized that truck stops are a place of commerce for those types of elements in society, whether it's drugs, lot lizards, prostitution, whatever the case may be, that that's a pretty common location. So keep in mind, that's the company that you're amongst when you go to, I'm not casting aspersions at truck drivers, by the way. I know a lot of truck drivers that are good, good people. I'm just saying that truck stops in general are water <laughs> holes for some less than desirable people. Anybody want to add anything before we go to the conflicted question? Yeah, Chris, I got one more thing. Um, that, that was really good advice, of course. But, uh, you know, if you are driving down the road on a highway, there's always a mile marker, usually every mile. And it's not a bad idea to keep track of those because say your vehicle breaks down and you're on 64, 95, and there's nothing around you. It's hard to call to say where you are. But hey, I, I broke down. I just passed my marker 64. Or when you go to a rest area or a truck stop, if you have to go there to use a bathroom or eat or something, just say, just know that you're at the truck stop near mile marker, whatever it is. And then, and when you leave your vehicle, always have your phone with you, of course, because, um, you know, that is a way you can call for help if you need it. But also, you can give your location. I'm at the truck stop near mile marker 98 or whatever it is. I think that's good for people to know, just to keep an eye with it, what those mile markers are and where you are on the road. That That's great advice. And it really speaks to situational awareness as well. So right, right. good. You're the first person I've ever heard say that one. So that's a Don Man original right there. Well done. <laughs> and the off ramps, the numbers for the off ramps correspond to the mile markers too. Right. So we see a sign that says, you know, exit 175, two miles ahead. That's mile marker 175, two miles ahead as well. Yeah, exactly. That, that's super, super advice. All right, let's go to the conflicted question of the day. It's a simple one. It is from the survivalist deck. So is having a dog a good idea after the collapse of modern society? Why and what breed? Mike, you go first. Uh, yes, absolutely. I am a huge proponent of dogs. Uh, as a matter of fact, you know, whenever I was deployed, it, especially if I was deployed and I wasn't part of a special operations element, man, I'll tell you what, the biggest thing that I missed was a dog. Um, yeah, uh, you know, dogs are great, not only for companionship, but dogs have got way better senses than I have. Um, if you've got a smart dog and that's the kind of dog that you want, <laughs> uh, for something like that, you, you don't want a dumb dog, you know, don't get, don't get some, you know, oh, it's, it's, it's my therapy dog. You know what? I don't care about your therapy dog. <laughs> uh, you know, cocker spaniels are not the way to go, but like, if you've got like a, uh, a Queensland healer or an Australian cattle dog type, you know, something between 25 and 50 pounds, man, those are great dogs. They're gonna, they're going to help you with, um, they're going to help you with your livestock. Like if I'm, you know, my chickens are constantly being guarded by my dogs. 
You know, that's one thing that I don't have to do because that's their job. They can have a job too. And it's not just guarding the place. So, you know, they can do that. Um, yeah, I am a huge proponent of, of medium sized dogs because they're usually the smart dogs. Good, good, good answer, Mike. Really good answer. Jeff, I'll go to you next. Uh, we'll qualify the question though, by saying that, uh, javelinas are not a K canine. So what? <laughs> but they are smart. You may they are smart and they are loyally smart. <laughs> no, I've got, uh, I've got two Australian shepherds and, uh, very good dogs are both 60 pounds because they're fat. Um, but the thing is, a dog is, especially if you're alone, a dog's going to allow you to get some sleep because the dog's going to be on guard duty. Even if they're sleeping next to you, they're going to wake up before you do. Uh, my male dog will be in the backyard and he'll just go to the fence and start barking. And we can't see anything. We can't hear anything. He can smell somebody coming. And we'll go over there, and sure enough, someone will come around the corner, especially if they have a dog with them. But he will smell them, and we'll say, okay, we have a neighbor who walks her dogs. We go, must be Nancy. Sure enough, five minutes later, here comes Nancy. Because, you know, she walks her dogs. But, you know, they alert you to anybody outside your fence. They are companions, and they do take care of you, and you take care of them. And they're And you want one big enough that if someone's coming at you and the dog is snapping and growling, that they're going to hesitate saying, okay, I may go after him. That dog's going to bite me in the ass. Now I've got one dog that will probably just show you where the valuables are and give you, <laughs> you, the, and give you the combination to the gun safe. But the male is very protective. In fact, when I'm walking, I was walking them yesterday. I, and I see people coming with dogs. I have to put him on a leash because he will step between them and me and get very protective. The other one just goes up and says, pet me. Right. Belly scritchies. I show you everything. Yeah. <laughs> Don? Well, you know, I've had two Dobermans, and I rescued them both, and uh, they were both males. And um, I ran with them quite a bit, meaning I'd go on trail runs yeah. or road runs, and they'd run on the side of me. As soon as I got picked up both dogs, I never needed a leash for them. They'd stay right on my side. And then I realized there was – they were the nicest companion you can have, as easy going as anything, until someone came to the door. Mm -hmm. And like what Jeff said, what a great early warning device they are. I mean, yeah, you could sleep because you know they're going to hear something, they're going to smell it, they're going to see it way before you do. And um, they're a great companion, but boy, they will attack and they'll go for the, you know, they'll go for the kill if somebody's trying to harm you. And um, so I would definitely, just because I've had Dobermans, I would go for another Doberman for those reasons. Right on, Don. I, I will mention, like you brought up the term rescue. Uh, we've rescued a number of pit bulls, and there is no dog more loyal than a rescue that has been through a horrible life. Like we have a, our female pit was used as a bait dog for fighting by her first owners. The second She is owners, a sweetie. She is. This, which is a testament to how resilient they are. So the first owners used her as a bait dog. The second owners beat the hell out of her. The third owners had good intentions, but they had a 90 pound female that didn't like this new female and shredded her on a Christmas Eve. It was a $1,200 vet bill. And then a number of people tried, they kept them apart in their house for six months and they were trying to find somebody. And finally we got her. And we didn't know at first, you know, 100% what to think of her because you get close to her and she'd growl. But we'd come to find out that that when she growls, she's talking. It wasn't that she was scared or anything like she still does it to this day. And then she'll give you a big kiss sort of thing. But she's one of the most loyal dogs I've ever had in, in my entire life. So, number one, I agree with everything that's been said as far as the the benefits of having dogs. They're, they are significant. I will mention that both of our pit bulls, if we have a cooler day, which is not that often here in Florida, but if we have a cooler day and we open our front door, we have a, a decorative steel door that looks like a screen door, but it's a steel door. And as far as our dogs are concerned, they own our street. Nobody is allowed to go down that street. Doesn't matter if they're on a bicycle, walking vehicle, they're on their street and they will alert on it before we even see people show up. It's like you said, Jeff, all of a sudden, 30 seconds later, here comes the person that we couldn't see, but they sure as heck knew that they were coming. So 
That's, that's probably one of the easiest questions that we've had from the conflicted deck, but actually a really good. Oh, uh, one other thing, though, in your prepping, prep for your dog. Right. Mm. Lots of dog food, any medicines they might need. Uh, you know, I have a dog that's on glucosamine and chondroitin because she hurt a knee. You know, make sure you've got plenty of what your dog needs, too. Man, that, that's great advice, Jeff. And I was just getting ready to mention to make sure that you have, you know, food and any types of meds for them. Anybody Take a canine had, med course. Yeah. Anybody who's had pit bulls know that for whatever reason, they have skin issues with, you know, allergies, almost every single one of them. Uh, we found a deal on Benadryl the other day ago. I can't remember what the number is. It was crazy. But my wife bought something like 3,000 Benadryls for about 15 bucks on special. And you know, that would normally cost 10 times that sort of price, right? But we have to give them to our pits because they get out in the sand and the, the skin gets irritated. Really, really good advice, Jeff. We've got two canine med kits. Uh, we have all the meds that they need. Our male, you know, he's almost 12 years old and he's fat and uh, he's he's had cancer multiple times and, you know, God willing. I told my wife I had a dream, by the way, that he told me that he's going to live to be 20. He's going to be the oldest pit bull ever in existence. So, <laughs> and then I told him that he was never allowed, he was not allowed to die until then. So anyway. <laughs> I, do, I do have a couple of points um, to turn people away from certain breeds. Um, so a lot of, man, and this is, this has actually been a problem. Um, so a lot of people saw the John Wick movies and said, oh, those Belgian Malinois, man, I want one of those. That's good. That's got to be a great dog to have. Man, I'm here to tell you, if, if you don't have experience as a dog handler and trainer, and if you have not got 16 hours a day to give to that dog, don't get a Belgian Malinois. Don't even get a working breed. You know, don't get, don't get a, don't get a shepherd. Well, you could get a shepherd, but you know, um, so I rescued, my rescue is she's, she's half Mal, half German shepherd. Thank God she's not a German shepherd or she's not, you know, the 16 hour a day dog. Um, she's still pretty high energy. At least she's only like, a, she's, she got a lot of the, sh the laziness from the shepherds. So she's, <laughs> she's only like a 10 hour a day dog, but she needs work. I mean, she's got to mm -hmm. have a job. She's got to be moving. She's a great dog, but I've got a lot of experience with dogs too. So I knew how to handle her, how to deal with her, the like, um, and she's just been awesome. She was treated very badly. Um, now, another thing, if you've got like livestock, getting a livestock guardian dog, um, if you live in an apartment, don't you dare, don't you dare get a livestock guardian dog. If you have less than five acres, don't you dare get a great Pyrenees or something like that. Don't do it. Why would you, you know, that's, that's a terrible thing. And understand that those dogs, they live outside. They want to live outside, but also understand that they're going to bark all the time. If you're going to get a livestock guardian dog, you should be living way out in the country. Okay. Um, because they're nocturnal and they're going to bark all the time. So if you don't want anybody to know where you are, don't get a livestock guardian dog because they're going to tell everybody where you are. Yeah, my shepherds bark. Uh, they're indoor dogs most of the time. But I have to take them out for long walks and hikes every day. And if I don't because I'm working on something or something else, they just come and give me the evil eye. Mm -hmm. you know, anytime I get up, they walk over like, are we going for a walk? Are we going for a hike? Yeah, there you go. But they definitely need the exercise. In my experience, yeah. shepherds and Malinois in particular have to be mentally stimulated, and that comes oh, yeah. from physical yeah. activity. If, they, if they don't Mike's have right, that, they need they, a job. Yeah, yeah. And, and pit bulls not as much, but they're still a power breed. And it, if our dogs seem to be restless, we take them for a walk, bring them back. They're exhausted, not from the walk. They're exhausted from the mental Stimulus. exercise because they see everything, they're smelling everything, and it wears them out. You know, yeah. we should probably do a whole episode of Survival Dispatch News or Survival <laughs> Dispatch dogs. Academy just on dogs because it's a it's a really good topic as it relates to the survival and prepping community for sure. But all right, guys, appreciate everybody's time. Appreciate everybody out there following Survival Dispatch.
be safe.